So my name is Russell Sullivan, and this talk is called The Birth of the Near Cloud. Uh, it's what you get when you put serverless and CRDTs together and host them at the edge. Uh, I figure everybody knows what serverless is. I, pretty, I figure everyone knows what the CDN edge is, the content delivery network edge. Can I get a show of hands, people that know CRDTs? Something about them? Anything about them? OK, good. Thank you. Wow. All right. Well, let me get this. So uh, I'll, I'll teach you what they are. Um, all right, a little bit about me. I'm a distributed system guy. I've created a bunch of NoSQL databases. Right now, I'm the CTO of a startup called Kuhiro. Um, when I talk about near cloud, what I'm talking about is a, well, the, the simplest definition is you have compute on data at the edge. So like the minimum requirements for a cloud are you have compute on data, right? You have to have both compute and data to do anything meaningful. And then to get it near your end users who are spread out all over the place, you host it at the edge. And I mean content delivery, network edge, uh, you know, down the block instead of in Virginia. So this is what most people think of as a cloud. You know, it's a big place in Virginia that AWS hosts. And the near cloud is, you know, it's spread out and all of those are working in conjunction. So it's just, just a visual. Um, so how did we implement this near cloud? This is actually pretty technically difficult to implement. So we have a serverless stack. The serverless functions access a CRDT-based data layer. And this is all running on a bunch of CDN edges. So the requirements are on the left, and the implementation is on the right. And what I'm going to do now is kind of explain the larger problem, the how, what, why, where, what this is good for, and how we got from compute to serverless and data to CRDT, the reasons and the, the reasons kind of that it's the only solution that works. So to start this, I like to do a little, you know, history lesson on the brief but amazing history of serverless and just explore the ecosystem. So Lambda kicked it off in 2014. All the other major cloud providers followed pretty quickly. It all started in the cloud. And a little while later, we're starting to get CDN Edge offering. Cloudflare Workers just came out. Lambda at Edge has been out for a little bit. And we see an expanding picture, right? Serverless is kind of creeping out and out. And it creeped into devices, which is kind of trippy when you think about it. You have embedded serverless stacks from in IoT, mobile, and storage even. Um, and what we're seeing is just massive expansion in, in like a three-year time period, which for any like history buffs of technology, that's ridiculously quick. And it looks like it's going to, and this is kind of a keyword in the community, but it's going towards a ubiquitous compute platform. That means serverless anywhere, right? Give us something, we'll put a serverless stack on it. You can run the same code everywhere. It's a, it's a beautiful idea. So I'm gonna take this busy visual and kind of break it down into an architectural diagram and then explain the value of what we're doing and kind of the, the, the difficulties. So first, let's look at a single cloud and then let's represent the CDN edges as racks of servers. And then, you know, all the devices that can be served, we're just gonna do a generic uh, device icon. And then since we're talking about the world, let's just think about this as inside and outside the last mile. So devices are outside the last mile and cloud and CDNs are inside the last mile. And I actually refer to this as a bullseye, a, a three ring bullseye with you know devices on the outside, CDNs on the middle and clouds on the inside. Am I going too fast? All right. Um, okay, so another thing you always have to talk about with serverless is the symbiosis it has the databases. Serverless is just compute, right? If you don't have databases, you can't do anything interesting. You can, you can do some stuff, but not much. So in the cloud, here's an abbreviated list of your choices. And I illustrate that in the middle. You know, you got Lambda talking to Dynamo. You got Google Cloud Functions talking to Data Store. Azure Functions talking to Cosmos DB. On the outside of that bullseye, the embedded serverless stacks call into embedded databases. So you have Greengrass calling into IoT or Firebase Functions calling into the Cloud Firestore. And that's the outside here, just with the, you know, serverless stack and database underneath. And there are no CDN edge databases for serverless. It's just something that doesn't exist, and I'll explain why. But what it represents as a whole, right? This is a part of the stack that's very useful, 
and it's not being used. So conceptually, it'd be nice to have, you know, anywhere there's serverless, you have a database to call into. That's where you get your, your maximum, uh, you know, utility from serverless. It can do meaningful work. But the reality is that there's a hole in the middle. So it's wasteful, right? We all know when you can move work from the cloud out to a stateful edge, or just, let's say, with images, when you move them out to the CDN edge, you get benefits in latency and bandwidth and robustness. And there's a lot of verticals that can benefit from this move. So let's ask ourselves the question, uh, why doesn't this exist? And the data replication requirements are pretty difficult, and it requires a new technology to work efficiently. Um, so physically, if you put serverless with state out at the edge, you have a geographically distributed database. But the API is function on database. So logically, you have a single database. And this is, it's technically a difficult problem. So when we get into geo-distributed databases, there are two technology choices that you can have. You can have consensus-based, which is two-phase commit, or you can have CRDT-based, which I'll explain to you in a little while, uh, and I have a good, <laughs> a good graphic for that. So consensus is Paxos, Raft, Spanner, Fauna, FoundationDB, NuoDB. They're all Paxos-based, essentially. And the problem with them, if you spread them out, say, across the U.S., is you have to make two round trips. So if we go back and forth from San Fran to New York twice, It'll take you 200 milliseconds, and if you're updating the same information sequentially, you get a whopping five transactions per second, which is bad. Uh, it's prohibitively slow for a lot of applications. So that's consensus problem. It's latency, and that's CRDT problem, right? Nobody here knows what they are, right? They're a new form of technology. The academia for consensus stuff is 70s, 80s. The academia for CRDTs is 2011 to now. So uh, here's a very simple example. Um, we're going to have three different actors here, which just think of them as uh, CDN pops. They're incrementing counters in parallel. This is about as simple an example as you can come up with. So what CRDTs do is they represent uh, updates or modifications as commutative operations. Commutative means you can apply them in any order and you still arrive at the same final state. So that works really well when you have geographic distance in between modifying databases. So I'm going to go through this example kind of quickly. Um, everybody starts with x equals 2. The top guy adds 1, bottom guy adds 2, left guy adds 3. This all happens at the same time. So, you know, we replicate the modifications, and this can happen in any order. The, the final state always comes out to eight. If you, have, if you start with two and add one, two, three in any order, you can three, two, one, or one, three, two, or whatever, you always add at eight. So that's a simple example of how you can arrive at the same final state with zero coordination, which means you don't play the, pay the latency penalties. So this doesn't just work for counters. It works for anything you have in a document database. It works for JSON. It's a, well, there are some trade-offs, but in general, you can represent all the nice stuff you have in JSON with CRDTs. And this, these attributes are what make CRDTs a perfect data layer for the edge. Your pops can run autonomously without needing consensus from, say, San Francisco to New York. And since they're running autonomously, they're implicitly running concurrently. And whenever you have autonomous and concurrent operation, you're going to have conflicts. And CRDTs, what they do is automatic conflict resolution. That's what they do. So there are also trade-offs, right? A serverless stack with a data layer that offers this, it's not ACID, right? Like you saw in the example, everybody didn't have the same value at the same time. That guarantee does not exist. It's called strong eventual consistency. It's basically the guarantee that they will eventually all converge to the same state and there won't be any loss of data. That's where the strong comes in. So 
we built this and we had an API and we decided <laughs> since you know CRDTs aren't that well known, we wouldn't introduce anything else new. So we used a serverless framework for compute because it took care of all of our you know, code and config uh, compliance issues, right? If you're, it, it just makes everything so easy to switch to our platform. And then we used a document database for data because people know them and they're, you know, I like JSON better than SQL these days. It's just a, 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 a taste. So, okay, here's the, here's the busy picture again with the hole in the middle. And what Kuhiro is trying to do is fill that hole with something that looks like all the other pictures, right? You have serverless plus a data layer. And we've strived for API compliance. Um, and uh, another way to put, uh, to talk about API compliance is to say no lock-in for serverless. And here's where I take my time out and go on a little rant and say serverless is a new technology. Um, hopefully we can avoid lock-in, right? Uh, for anyone who has busted out of locking in the service, it's awful, painful work that represents no progress. So we should all work towards this. It's a great goal, and we're all going to go multi-cloud in a little while. So I think it's a great thing. So all right, ran over. I'm not a, not a big ranter. I just wanted to put that in. Um, okay. Oh. Okay, so we wanted to have code and configuration compliance, right? And that's what the serverless framework gives you. You just take your Lambda code, and you if it's, if it's in the serverless framework, you can easily ship it to Kuhero, or you could ship it to Google Cloud or Azure Functions, doesn't really matter. But they took care of all of that. And then we went a little further in that, you know, part of your code is your data API. So we, had a, we, we got pretty good coverage of API compliance between DynamoDB and our data layer. And the end goal is you can switch back and forth, right? There's no lock-in. You can... Just take your code and data, you can push it out at the edge and get the benefits that you get out at the edge. If you don't like it, push it back, right? You're not locked in. Or some people run them in parallel because in the end, this is all you know, part of a larger serverless ecosystem. So this is a real thing, right? This is what, how we think the near cloud is gonna begin, right? A real meaningful work is gonna be done at what's now known as the CDN edge. And that's how we implemented it for the, you know, the reasons I just gave. And then finally, you know, here's the shameless promotion. We're in beta. We're accepting beta customers. Email me. I'd love to talk to you. 